in this session we will be discussing about the general senses all of us know that there are sensory system and motor system are there the sensory system brings is the system which bring information from periphery to the central nervous system this is called sensory system now the sensation its sensation can be divided into two there are general senses and special senses all of us know that there are four special senses are there <coughs> these are vision audition gestation and olfaction the general senses general senses can be divided into two somatic and visceral visceral general senses include the pain baroreception and chemoreception somatic general senses include touch pressure temperature pain etc now receptors so we already discussed that there is there will be a stimulus stimulus is monitored by a monitor called receptors these are the uh, receptors are the structures which catch the sensory stimulus now from the receptors the afferent sensory nerve starts and reaches to the central nervous system so the receptors are the first part or first structure of the sensory part so it is the receptors are also called as end organs now the receptors may be it may be a special structure or even a nerve terminal now some receptors are encapsulated structures at the beginning of the afferent nerve examples are meesner's corpuscles pacinian corpuscles etc so receptors are the first structure in the the nervous system or afferent a sensory part of the nervous system now the receptors it may be either a special structure or a nerve terminal some receptors are encapsulated structure at the beginning of the afferent nerve example is meesner's corpuscles pacinian corpuscles etc now there are some receptors which are expanded structures which forms the beginning of the afferent nerve these are examples are merkel's disc raffinis end organs now receptors we have the general senses and special senses now the receptors of special senses are we know that there are four special senses are there these are vision audition gestation and olfaction we for vision the receptors are rods and cones of the retina for audition the receptors are the hair cells or organ of corti in the cochlea for gestation the receptors are gestatory cells of the taste buds in the tongue and for olfaction it is olfactory neuron present in the olfactory epithelium so vision roots and cones audition hair cells and organ of corti gestation gestatory cells of the taste bud and olfaction olfactory neuron in the olfactory epithelium somesthetic and visceral sense receptors this may the first one in this touch and pressure the receptors are merkel's disc meesner's corpuscles pacinian corpuscles raffinis end organ and free nerve ending are the receptors for touch and pressure now for the receptors of the pain is free nerve ending and receptors of cold is crossus end organ receptors of warm is again free nerve ending receptors of proprioception are muscle spindle and golgi tendon organ then crista and macula of vestibular apparatus these are the receptors of proprioception chemo reception chemo reception is done by carotid body central chemo receptors in the brain stem and gluco receptors in the hypothalamus baroreceptors in the body are carotid sinus baroreceptors afferent arteriole of the renal artery and left ventricular mechanoreceptors these are some example for these are the baroreceptors in the body now there is another term called extroreceptors extroreceptors are the receptors which send an immediate external environment example touch pain heat cold receptors so these are called extroreceptors immediate ex which send information which information immediate from an immediate external environment tele receptors 
Tene receptors are the receptors where the origin of the stimulus come from a far distance. Example, vision and hearing. These are the tele receptors. Now, intro receptors. Intro receptors are the receptors which detect any change in the internal environment. Example is baroreceptors, chemoreceptors. Now, the proprioceptors. receptors. These are the receptors which deals with degree of torn, contraction of the skeletal muscle, degree of flexion, extension and other movements of the joints. Example is receptors, these receptors are muscle spindle and Golgi tendon organ. Muscle spindle which provide information about change in the muscle length and Golgi tendon organ provide information about the muscle torn. Golgi tendon organs are located at the junction of the muscle and tendon. It consists of a capsule made up of concentric sheets of cytoplasm. Inside the capsule, there are small bundles of tendon fibers. This organ is innervated by one or more myelinated nerve fibers which divide to form several branches. These, are the recept these receptors are stimulated by a pull up on the tendon which during active contraction of the muscle. The next time of type of receptors are proprioceptors are muscle spindle. These are spindle shaped sensory organ situated at the skeletal muscle. The spindle is bounded by a fusiform connective tissue capsule within which there are few muscle fibers of special kind. These fibers are called intrafusal fibers whereas extrafusal fibers constitute the main bulk of the muscle. Now, each muscle spindle contains 6 to 14 intrafusal fibers. So, it is made up of mainly that is the uh, this there are intrafusal fibers are present in the in the muscle spindle and the for the muscle it is extrafusal fibers. Each spindle contains 16 to 14 intrafusal fibers. Now, these fibers contain several nuclei that are located near the middle of the fiber. These are called nuclear bag fibers. So, this uh, in, the, in the intrafusal fibers, there are, there are several nucleus located in the middle of the fiber. This is called nuclear bag fibers. In, in other intrafusal fibers, nuclei lie in a single chain without any dilatation. This is called nuclear chain fibers. So, two types of uh, intrafusal fibers are there, nuclear bag fibers and nuclear chain fibers. Nuclear bag fibers are the fibers where nuclei are located in the middle of the fiber, several nuclei located at the middle of the nucleus. But nuclear chain fibers are a single nuclei without any dilatation is located in uh, as a single chain is called nuclear, nuclear the nucleus lie in a single chain is called without dilatation is called nuclear chain fiber. Several nuclei in the nuclear back fibers, several nuclei located and the uh, nuclear chain fibers means nuclei located as a chain without any dilatation. Now, each muscle spindle is innervated by sensory as well as motor nerve. There are sensory two types of sensory, uh, there are two types of nerves are there primary and secondary. Primary uh, sensory are rapidly adapting and secondary are slow adapting nerves. Muscle spindle provide information to the CNS about the extended extent and rate of change in the length of muscle. What is the length, what is the change in the length of muscle? How much change is the in the length of the muscle? It is a, to and it gives information to the CNS regarding this. Now, once we discuss about the receptors, what are the properties of receptors? The one important property peculiarity is specificity of the response. That is each receptor respond to a specific type of stimulus. For example, is rods and cones respond to the light. It never responds to an other olfactory or any other pain or pain stimulus. So, rods and cones special for the light receptor. These are the light receptors only. So, the first one is response will be specific. Each receptor responds to a specific type of stimulus. So, so, example is roads and cones are activated only by light. Next one is another law called 
web another a law called weber fechner law for example there is a sub in, in there is a stimulus there is a stimulus is given to a receptor and consider it is 10 and the sense perceived is 1 now if you are increasing the intensity tenfold you are giving a hundred but the perception intensity won't be won't become ten times it become only doubled for example if you are using a small pin and making a prick a small prick so intensity is this if you are using a high intensity stim the pain perceived will be uh, if you are using a with a small needle and making a small prick soft prick so the pain perceived will be there will be an amount of pain will be there now if you are using the same needle a with high intensity prick that is 10 times of the previous prick but the pain produced won't be 10 times it will be the pain will be only doubled that is our body can perceive pain due to low intensity stimulus as for example a severe crushing injury does not cause a death due to pain so this is called weber fechner law now third type of third peculiarity of this receptors are its adaptation that is whenever a receptor whenever a, you are giving a stimulus in the initial time it responds vigorously and there is will be a time come it won't respond as the stimulus continues at times comes when the receptors despite of the presence of the stimulus stop the response to the stimulus For example i'll tell you when a person is put on clothes in the beginning he will be aware of wearing the clothes but later it comes that time passes he won't be aware of regarding he won't be beware of regarding that clothes so this is called adaptation but not all the stimulus will be uh, will go for adaptation so only some uh, only some stimulus some receptors go for adaptation there are some receptors who now which does not develop an adaptation example pain pain never develop an adaptation or muscle spindle never develop an adaptation now another exam another peculiarity of the uh, the receptor is its generator potential so when a receptor is stimulates it develop a non propagated current called generator potential when the generator potential is sufficient the action potential develop and conduct the impulses so whenever you are giving a stimulus in the receptor a generator potential will be produced now if the generator potential is sufficient it double it causes an action potential and conduction of impulses otherwise it won't conduct the impulses in this session we will we discussed about different types of sensors special sensors general sensors and different types of receptors and different types of receptors proprioceptors and different and uh, what are the different properties of receptors this session will be discussing about the reflexes and reflex are the pathway of reflexes reflex can be defined as a mechanism by which sensory impulse is automatically convert into a motor effect through the involvement of a central nervous system that is a sensory impulse is automatically converted into a motor effect very fast through the central nerve the, but the central with the effect but there is along with that there is involvement of central nervous system is there an inborn and rapid response to a stimulus from an external environment so the automatic response that occurs very rapidly and without conscious control there will be a response which is very rapid and without it is without a conscious control is called reflex so there will be a stimulus from an external environment an inborn rapid uh, an inborn uh, from a to a stimulus 
and a response will be a rapid step a response will be the without a conscious control it is called a reflex. So, for a reflex action there will be uh, there must be a will and there must be a motor effect without participation of will. So, there will be a motor response without participation of will this is called reflex. Now, the reflex may be a spinal reflex or a brainstem reflex or a cortical reflex. Now, what is the pathway of reflex? How the reflex occurs? The pathway of reflex is called reflex arc. Reflex arc can be defined as a neural pathway that mediates a reflex action. Now, the reflex arc, what are the parts of a reflex arc? It consists of a there will be a receptor which receives the stimulus. Then there will be an afferent nerve which transfer information to the sender. Then there will be a sender which coordinate the information and there will be an efferent nerve which returns the which gives the action which gives the that is afferent nerve motor action and there will be an efferent organ which takes action. So, a reflex arc it is a pathway of reflexes. So, it consists of a receptor, an afferent nerve, a center, efferent nerve and effector organ or efferent organ. Now, this the reflexes can be classified into four types. The first one is a superficial reflex, second one is a deep reflex, another type of reflex is a visceral reflex, another type of reflex inborn or acquired reflexes. Now, the superficial reflexes. Superficial reflexes are polysynaptic reflexes elicited by uh, stimulating skin or mucous membrane result in contraction of the muscle or a group of muscles. So, superficial reflexes the receptors will be at the skin or the mucous membrane. So, it can be stimulated by these are polysynaptic reflexes where lots of synapses are there. Polysynaptic reflexes and can it causes once this this causes contraction of muscle or a group of muscle. Example are conjunctival and corneal reflexes, pupillary reflexes, gag reflexes, superficial abdominal reflex, plantar reflex, anal reflex and cremastric reflex. So, so we will go through each reflexes in detail. First, first superficial reflex it is a conjunctival and corneal reflex. That is this reflex can be elicited by touching the bulbar conjunctiva or corneo conjunctival junction with a wisp of cotton. So, once you are touching the bulbar conjunctiva or corneo conjunctival junction with a wisp of cotton, what will be the reaction? There will be a reflex reaction blinking of both eyes. So, this is a reflex. So, we take a uh, wisp of cotton, try to touch the bulbar conjunctiva or corneo conjunctival junction and there will be blinking of both eyes this is a reflex. Now, here the reflex arc will be there will be touch receptors that is receptors are touch receptors. Then the sensory uh, afferent are the ophthalmic division of trigeminal nerve. The afferent are ophthalmic division of the trigeminal nerve. Then the sender is pons for this reflex and the efferent is the facial nerve and the effector muscle or the, the efferent muscle is orbicularis oculi muscle. So, conjunctival and corneal reflexes are this is this reflex can be elicited by touching the bulbar conjunctiva or corneo conjunctival junction with a wisp of cotton and uh, the result will be blinking of the eyes. So, the center is pons here. Another example of superficial reflex is pupillary reflex. There are two types of pupillary reflex are there direct and indirect light reflex and accommodation reflex. Light reflex is tested by shining the torch to the eyes bringing from lateral side. So, if you are shining the torch uh, direct light reflex is tested by shining the torch to the eyes bringing from lateral side result is you can see the constriction of pupil this is direct right reflex. Indirect uh, uh, light reflex is shining the torch on your eyes 
causing constriction of pupils on the opposite eye. If you blink, if you uh, shine the torch to one eye, it causes constriction of the pupil on the opposite eye. This is due to crossing of the fibers at the level of optic chiasma. So, pupillary reflux are two types of pupillary reflux are there. First one is direct and indirect light reflux. Direct light reflux means if you are shining the torch to the eyes bringing from the lateral side, you can see constriction of pupil. And indirect light reflux is one, once you are shining the torch on your eyes, uh, con on one eye causes constriction of the pupil on the opposite eye. But this is because of mainly the crossing of the fibers at the level of optic chiasma. Now, what is the what is the reflux arc for this light reflexes? First of all, rods and cones. These are the receptors. Now, optic nerve is the afferent fiber. The center is the midbrain. Then, oculomotor nerve is the efferent fiber, and sphincter pupillae is the uh, effector organ or efferent organ. Next type of reflux is the accommodation reflux. We discussed there are two types of pupillary reflux. First one is direct and indirect light refluxes and the second one is accommodation reflux. Accommodation reflux is that we ask the subject to look far and then suddenly to the nearest object. We are asking him to look far and then suddenly to the nearest object. There you can see the convergence of eyeball like this we are asking him to look far and nearest object. We can see the convergence of eyeball and constriction of pupil. The reflux arc is as same as that of light reflux. Now, in certain conditions, this reflux is absent. In conditions like neurosyphilis of the uh, 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 neurosyphilis, this reflux is absent. But in uh, in condition like Argel Robertson pupil, accommodation reflux is present, but pupillary reflux is absent. Next type of reflux, superficial reflux, is the gag reflux. Here, we are. It is tested by touching the posterior pharyngeal wall with a cotton swab or cotton stick. So, with a cotton, cotton stick touch the, try to touch the posterior pharyngeal wall. Now, what will be the response? There is a nauseating effect, a vomiting effect will be there. So, this is called gag reflux. Now, that the receptors are touch receptors, uh, are the touch receptors. The afferent fibers are glossopharyngeal nerve, medulla as the center and vagus nerve is the nerve the efferent effer, nerve and the muscle act or the efferent muscles are the pharyngeal muscles. Now, in case of any of the palsy of any of the nerve, for example, glossopharyngeal palsy or vagus palsy, this reflux will be absent. That is, ninth nerve and tenth nerve palsy, this reflux may be absent. So, gag reflux is tested by touching the posterior pharyngeal wall. Pharyngeal wall with a cotton swab stick. Another type of superficial reflux is abdominal reflux. This is exactly a spinal reflux. This is tested by we are asking the subject to lie relaxed in supine position with an uncovered abdomen. Now, stroke the abdominal fall from lateral to the medial aspect. It causes con contraction of the underlying musculature. That is superficial abdominal reflux, we are stroking the abdominal wall from lateral to the medial aspect. It causes contraction of the abdominal musculature. Here the spinal segment is T7 and T12, T7 to T12. So, it is a spinal reflux. So, the center is at the spinal cord and it is the sec spinal segment, the center is T7 to T12. So, these reflexes are absent in upper motor neuron lesion above the spinal level. Next is the, the its, its uh, reflux arc is the first of all the receptors are touch receptors. Now, the, the uh, afferent organ is afferent nerve is sensory spinal nerve. The center is T7 to T12 spinal segment. 
Now, if FRN nerve is the motor part of the T7 to T12 and the muscles or afferent muscles or afferent organ is or affector organ is the abdominal muscles. Next type of reflux is the, so another superficial reflux is the plantar reflux. Now, we are, asked, we are just scratching the sole of the foot. Now, what will be the, uh, the reaction? Plantar flexion of the great toe and other fingers. Now, there are in some conditions, there in, for example, in some conditions, there is a, uh, there is a sign called Babinski sign is there. If you in the Babinski sign means, if you scratch the sole of the foot, there will be dorsiflexion of the great toe and fanning out of the other fingers. Unless the subject is infant or post epileptic edema, Babinski sign indicates the pyramidal tract lesion. So, plantar reflux is that is once you scratch the sole of the foot, there is plantar flexion of the great toe and other fingers. But in case of pyramidal tract injury or in infants or in post epileptic coma, there is a sign, there is an abnormal reflux can be seen. This is called Babinski sign. So, when you once you scratch the sole of the foot, you will get the dorsiflexion of the great toe and fanning out of the other toes or other fingers. This is called Babinski sign. Next type of reflux is the anal reflux. Anal reflux here, the soft skin around the anus produces contraction of the once you uh, use the, the contraction of the anal sphincter. That is, sender is S3 to S4. Another type of reflux, another type of superficial reflux is cremastric reflux. That is, stroking the skin on the medial thigh produces the movement of the testicle upwards. Sender is L1. Now, these are the superficial reflexes. So, there are some deep reflexes also. Deep reflexes are exactly the tendon reflexes and usually the, the, the receptors are usually the muscle spindles. There are lots of tendon reflexes, jerks are available, there are jaw jerks, there are jaw jerks, jaw jerks are there, bicep jerks are there, tricep jerks are there, supinator jerks are there, knee jerks and ang knee jerk, angle jerks etc. These are the important the tendon reflexes or deep reflexes. The first one is the jaw jerk. We are asking the subject to open mouth a little. Place the finger, place one finger on his cheek. Tape it, tap it with other hand or a knee hammer. <coughs> the result will be contraction of the muscles with closing of the jaw. This is called a jaw jerk. Asking the subject to open the mouth a little. Place the finger, finger on his cheek. Tap it with other hand or with a knee hammer. Result is the contraction of the muscles closing of and the closing of the jaw. Next one is the bicep jerk. Another deep reflex is bicep jerk. Here the elbow will be fla flexed at right angles with the forearm placed in a semi pronated position. Examiner places the thumb or index finger on the biceps and strike with a knee hammer. The biceps contracts. Now, the, the receptors are stretch receptors. Now, the afferent nerve is the musculocutaneous nerve which supplies to the, which is the afferent supply to the uh, biceps. And the, uh, in the center is C5 to C, C5 and C6 segments and the efferent is again the musculocutaneous nerve. The effector organ is the biceps muscle. So, this is the bicep jerk. Next is the tricep jerk. Tricep jerk, in order to do the tricep jerk, stretch the elbow and allow the forearm to rest on the chest, subject's chest. Then ta uh, tap the biceps tendon, there will be contraction of the triceps. The receptors are stretch receptors. The afferent nerve is the radial nerve, sender is C6 and C7. Efferent nerve is the radial, again the radial nerve and the effector organ or the efferent organ is triceps muscle. Next type of deep reflux is the supinator jerk. For in order to do the supinator jerk, 
keep the forearm in mid prone position and blow over it over the styloid process causing the contraction of the brachioradialis. So again the receptor is the stretch receptor, afferent is the radial, radial nerve, sender is C5-C6, efferent is again the radial nerve and efferent muscle is the brachioradialis muscle. Next type of jerk is the knee jerk. So, in order to do the uh, produce the knee jerk, stroke the patellar tendon. Uh, the subject should be in sitting position and you just stroke the patellar tendon, it causes an extension of the knee by the contraction of the quadriceps. Then receptors are stretch receptors, nerve, the afferent nerve is the afferent nerve is the femoral nerve and L, uh, L3, L4 is the sender, L2, L, L2 through L2 to L4 is the sender and efferent nerve is the femoral nerve and quadriceps femoris is the uh, muscle. Now angle jerk. In order to do angle jerk, place the lower limb on bed so that it is slightly everted and slightly flexed. With one hand, slightly dorsiflex the foot so that it stretches the Achilles tendon. Strike the tendon with knee hammer, response will be contraction of the calf muscle. The receptors are stretch receptor, center is S1 and S2 and the efferent organ is calf muscle. Now, clonus. When a muscle is subject to a sudden continuous stretch, there is a regular oscillation of contraction. This is called clonus. Now, sustained clonus is seen, usually seen and at upper motor neuron lesion. There are two types of clonus usually seen, patellar clonus and angle clonus. How to test for angle clonus? In order to test the angle clonus, bend the subject's knee slightly and support with one hand. Grasp the forefoot with one hand and suddenly dorsiflex the forefoot. So you will get the clonus. To elicit the patellar clonus, suddenly move the patella downward. You can see the clonus in the patella. Now usually, we discuss the deep tendon reflexes. Deep tendon reflexes are exaggerated in upper motor neuron lesion and it decreases or absent in lower motor neuron lesion. So if there is lesion in the upper neuron, motor neuron, it causes the deep tendon reflex get exaggerated, an exaggerated reflex will be there. But in case of a lower motor neuron lesion, this deep tendon reflexes become decreased or absent. Now what are the properties of reflexes? The first one is delay. That is between the application of stimulus and starting of the response, there is a time interval called delay. It is due to the passage of impulses through synapses. The delay is minimum for monosynaptic reflexes and more in polysynaptic reflexes. That is once you apply a stimulus or when there is a stimulus and there is a response. So, the stimulus has to pass through, the impulses has to pass through the efferent nerve, it reaches the sender and it passes through the effect, efferent nerve and reaches the organ. Now, if it is a monosynaptic reflex, the, the reaction will be fast and if it is a polysynaptic reflex, when compared to monosynaptic, it will be a bit slow. And this time period between the application of the stimulus and the, the starting of the response in that time interval is called delay. Next one is, next uh, speech is, my next property is summation. There are two types of summation usually see, temporal and spatial summation. Now, <coughs> temporal summation means if you are applying a sub-threshold stimulus, a stimulus which does not produce, usually a stimulus which is a small stimulus you are, it says less than that threshold, a stimulus you are applying, there will not be any response. Now apply a second stimulus, second sub-threshold stimulus quickly, taking care of the refractory period of the nerve. Now the reaction, there will be now a response occur, although each stimulus are individually sub-threshold. This is called temporal summation. 
that is you are first of all you are applying a sub threshold stimulus a sub threshold stimulus is a stimulus which does not produce a response which does not have that much effect to produce a response so you are applying a sub threshold stimulus so once you apply a sub threshold stimulus usually there won't be any response but there is a refractory period then if you apply a, a second sub threshold stimulus on the with the same intensity quickly before the refractory period ends so there will be a response that is there will be summation of these both stimulus and there will be a reaction will be there or action will be there this is called tem temporal summation that is application of sub threshold and the second sub threshold will be applied before the refractory period it causes now a response will occur and e stimulus that uh, because of the summation this is called temporal summation another type of summation is the spatial summation spatial summation means that is uh, if two sub threshold stimulus we are applying simultaneously at different spot it can evoke a response although individually individually individual stimulus fails to do so so again if you are applying a sub threshold it won't cause a response if you are applying two sub threshold in the stimulus at same intensity so there will be summation it causes a response this is called a spatial summation so if two sub threshold stimulus applied simultaneously but different spot can evoke a response is called this is called a spatial summation next is irradiation for example if you are giving a low intensity stimulus it can cause reflex contraction for a few muscles if you are giving a strong stimulus it can produce a reflex contraction of a large number of muscles this is called irradiation for example if you are giving a small pin prick you either may be your finger may you may be draw your finger and if you are giving a big prick your entire hand will be you may remove the entire hand or you withdraw entire hand this is called irradiation so if you are giving a low intensity stimulus it can cause reflex interaction contraction of the few muscles whereas a strong stimulus can produce reflex contraction of large number of muscles so in this session we discussed about the what is reflexes how the reflex is produced now what is the ref, what is meant by reflex arc what is the pathway of reflexes how it is passed and its a pathway including the receptor first of all the receptor then afferent nerve then center then efferent nerve and efferent organ then we classified the different types of reflexes the like superficial reflexes and we uh, discussed about the different types of superficial reflexes like congenital corneal uh, the conjunctival reflex a conjunctival reflex pupillary reflex gag reflex abdominal reflex plantar reflex then we discussed about the uh, deep reflexes especially the the tendon reflexes like jaw jerk bicep jerk tricep jerk knee jerk ankle jerk etc then we discussed about the some properties of reflexes like delay summation uh, 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 summation irradiation etc In this session will be discussing about the spinal cord all of us know that spinal cord lies in the vertebral canal so because of it is it's a it's as it is in, uh, inside the vertebral canal this vertebral canal vertebra provides the protection of the spinal cord so the spinal cord it is extend from the foramen fora magnum as a continuation of the medulla that is at the cervical region it starts from the as a continuation of the fora, as a, from the foramen magnum as a continuation of medul, uh, medulla and comes down through this vertebral canal to the lower level of l1 and some in some cases it is to the upper level of l2 then it this give rise to a 31 pairs of the spinal nerve you already discussed regarding the spinal nerve and 
this spinal cord give rise to 31 pairs of spinal nerve and it comes down and at the in the lower level its lower part, part become conical shaped this part is called conus medullaris now the apex of the conus part or conical part it is continued as phylum terminale Now, the cord present two thickening at the cervical and lumbar en enlargement and it give rise to large nerves to the limbs. So, at the lumbar region and the cervical region, there are two enlargement can be seen at the cord. And this is the position where it give rise to uh, large nerves to the limbs because it have, there will be lots of nerves goes to the lower limb and upper limb. Now, the nerve is spinal cord is shorter than the vertebral column. So, the, nerve, the nerves that arise from the lumbar sacral, lumbosacral and coccygeal region of the spinal cord do not leave the vertebral column at the same level as they exit the cord because the spinal cord is short when compared to the vertebral column. Now, the root of these spinal nerves angled inferiorly in the vertebral cavity and form the end of the spinal cord, cord uh, uh, spinal cord like a wisp of hair that is at the low, at the lower level at the lumbar region the roots of the spinal nerves which is coming down in the for the sacral region and coccygeal region this angled inferiorly in the vertebral cavity from the end of the spinal cord like a wisp of hair the root of this nerve is called corda equina or horse tail. So, this horse tail shaped, so it is called corda equina. Now, we already discussed that there are 31 pairs of spinal nerves. Spinal nerves are the part of the peripheral nervous system. The 31 pairs of the spinal nerve, it includes 8 in the cervical region. 12 in the thoracic region, 5 in the lumbar region, 5 in the coccygeal region, uh, 5 in the sacral region and 1 in the coccygeal region. Now, each pair of the spinal nerve passes through a pair of intervertebral foramina located between two successive vertebra. That is the root, it comes out from the spinal cord. Now, the spinal nerve, the spinal cord, it is having some covering for the protection, especially for the protection. This covering of the spinal cord is known as meninges. And this meninges is a three layers of connective tissue membrane. So, meninges is having, again it is having three layers. The layers are called dura mater, arachnoid mater and pia mater. So, meninges is the covering of the spinal cord and it is a three layered covering. It includes the dura mater, arachnoid mater and pia mater. So, the dura mater. Now, it is a dense strong fi fibrous membrane that engloses the spinal cord and the corda equina. So, dura mater it is the outer covering and it is continuous above through the foramen magnum with the meningeal layer of dura covering the brain. So, this meninges again covering the brain and this dura mater continues through the foramen magnum to the brain. Inferiorly, it ends at the phylum terminale at the level of the lower border of the second sacral vertebra. It comes down and reaches till the level of the second sacral vertebra. The dural sheath lies loosely in the vertebral canal and separated from the wall of the vertebral canal at the dural space. This contain loose connective tissue and the, and the internal vertebral venous fluxus also. So, this is the outer covering, the dura mater. Dura mater extend along each spinal nerve root and is continuous with the connective tissue surrounding each spinal nerves. So, this is called epineurium. So, dura mater is continuous with the spinal nerve root. This is called epineurium. The inner surface of the dura mater is in contact with the 
arachinoid matter. Inside the dura mater, we have the arachinoid matter and the inner surface is in contact with the arachinoid matter. Now, the second layer is the arachinoid matter. Arachinoid matter is a delicate imper impermeable membrane that covers between the, du that is, lies between the dura mater externally and pia mater internally. It separates from pia by a white space called a subarachinoid space. The arachinoid matter continues along with the spinal nerve root, forming a small lateral extension of the subarachinoid space. The third and the inner covering is called pia mater of the spinal cord. Is called the curd and the inner covering of the spinal cord is called pia mater. It is a vascular membrane that closely covers the spinal cord and is thickened on either side between the nerve root to form ligamentum denticulum which passes lateral and adhere to the arachinoid and dura mater. It forms the ligamentum denticulum. The pia mater extends along each nerve root and become continuous with the connective tissue surrounding each spinal nerve. Now, what is the function of this pia mater? Main thing is that protection. It protects the spinal cord and compression and uh, from shock and compression. And all these things protect the spinal nerve also. So, all these things, uh, the dura mater, pia mater, and arachinoid mater makes the spaces. There are spaces can be seen between all these. There are three, three covering are there and there are spaces can be seen between each covering. And these are filled with some, uh, the, there are three spaces are there. There is epidural space is there, subdural space is there, subarachinoid space is there. Epidural sp uh, space is external to the dura mater. Usually anesthetics are injected at this space. Next is the subdural space. It is below the dura mater. That is below the dura mater. It is it is it contains the serous fluid. Third space is the subarachinoid space. Subarachinoid space is the space between the pia mater and arachinoid mater. This is the space which is filled with cerebrospinal fluid or CSF. Now, what is cerebrospinal fluid? It is a modified tissue fluid. So, it is it contains in the subarachinoid space. It is also there in the ventricular system of the brain and subarachinoid space. So, it is there in the brain and the spinal cord. Now, it is space around, it, it is seen in the subarachinoid space, only the subarachinoid space, but CSF reflex uh, that is in the subarachinoid space of the brain and it CSF reflex lymph in the central nervous system. That is, instead of lymph, outside the body here, the cerebrospinal fluid is there. So, it is a fluid, it is a tissue fluid, modified type of tissue fluid which is seen in the brain and spinal cord. And especially in the brain, it is seen at the sub uh, in the seen at the ventricular system. And in the spinal cord, it is at the subarachinoid space. Now, CSF replaces lymph in the CNS. Now, how the CSS is formed? CSF is formed, the bulk of the CSS is formed from the choroid plexus of the lateral ventricle which is seen at the brain and a very small amount by the conoid plexus of the third and fourth ventricle. So, formation of CSS, CSF is mainly from the choroid plexus and from the conoid plexus. That is, chor choroid plexus are present at the la lateral ventricle and conoid plexus are present at the third and fourth ventricle. So, CSL formation is that the choroid and conoid plexus. And it is also formed by some cap by the capillaries on the surface of the brain and spinal cord. So, formation of the CSL is from the choroid plexus and conoid plexus which is seen in the brain. And it may be also may form from the capillaries and uh, capillaries uh, on the surface of the brain and spinal cord. Now, how much is the total amount of CSF in the body? It is around 150 ml and it is formed at the rate of 200 per ml per day. That is uh, per hour. That is total amount of CSF is 150 ml 
and for, it is formed at the rate of 200 ml per hour. Normal pressure formed by CSA is 60 millimeter to 10 millimeter of water. Now, how the CSF, we discuss that CSF is a fluid which is, which is formed at the choroid plexus and conoid plexus and which is seen at the uh, arachnoid space also, which is seen in the subarachnoid space. So, where, how the circulation is of the CSF? There are two lateral ventricles communicate with the interventricular foramen. This is called, uh, this is uh, called foramen of Monroe with the third ventricles. That is two lateral ventricles communicate with the interventricular foramen with the third ventricle. The third ventricle is connected with the fourth ventricle by aqueduct of Sylvius. The fourth ventricle is in, uh, is in uh, continu con continuation with the narrow central canal of the spinal cord and through the third, for uh, through the third foramina and its root with the subarachnoid space. Now, the central canal has small dilatation at its inferior end referred as terminal ventricle. The CFS of passes from each lateral ventricle to the third ventricle through interventricular foramina or foramina, foramina of Monroe and ends from third ventricle to the fourth ventricle and through aqueduct of Sylvius. And from fourth ventricle, CF sub passes to the subarachnoid space through the medial and lateral, uh, 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 through that is from third ventricle to the, from fourth ventricle, CSF passes to the subarachnoid space. Again, the pathway of the CSF, the central, uh, that is CSF passes from each lateral ventricle to the third ventricle through interventricular foramen, that is foramen of Mandra, and from third ventricle, to the fourth ventricle through aqueduct of Sylvius, from fourth ventricle to the subarachnoid space. Now, CSF absorption. CFSF is absorbed chiefly by arachnoid villi and granulation and its granulation and is drained into the cranial venous sinuses. It is also absorbed by partially by perineural lymphatics around the first, second, seventh and eighth cranial lymph. It is also absorbed by veins related to the spinal nerves. Now, the, what is the function of the CSF? It is having protective function. It gives nutrition and it is the pathway of excretion from the CNS. Now, cerebrospinal fluid are present inside the cerebrum. We discussed about the cerebrospinal fluid and the uh, different protective membranes. Now, once this protective membrane of the covering may get inflamed, this inflammation of the protective covering of the brain and spinal cord is called meningitis. It may be caused by any virus or bacteria or any other microorganism. Sometimes even some drugs also may cause the in inflammation and inf inflammation of the meninges. So, meningitis is a term used to discuss the, it used to describe the inflammation of the meningeal covering of the brain and spinal cord, usually caused by bacterial, viral and other microorganism infection. So, it is a life threatening condition because it is this meninges is very proximity to the brain and spinal cord. So, it is a medical emergency. So, treatment has to be done as early as possible. So, meningitis is inflammation to the meninges or inflammation to the coverings of the brain and spinal cord. And as it is very proximity, it is in very proximity with the brain and spinal cord. It is life threatening, so it is a medical emergency. Now, what are the most common symptoms seen in meningitis? Usually headache may be there. There may be neck stiffness associated with fever, confusion, altered consciousness. There is chance of vomiting. Inability to tolerate light, that is photophobia, and inability to tolerate loud noise, that is phonophobia. These are the symptoms. Meningitis, headache may be there, neck stiffness may be there, vomiting may be there, photophobia and phonophobia may be there. Now, lumbar puncture. So, whenever we need 
CSF because to diagnose to for a diagnostic purpose we have to collect the CSF cerebrospinal fluid from the subarachnoid space. So, this procedure is known as lumbar puncture. So, lumbar puncture can be defined as or it is a diagnostic procedure, diagnostic at a time therapeutic procedure that is performed in order to collect the sample of CSF for biochemical, for microbiological or cytological analysis or sometimes as a treatment to relieve increased intracranial pressure. So, in order for biochemical or microbiological analysis, sometimes we need for the investigative purposes or as for most diagnostic purpose, we use CSF. So, this cerebrospinal fluid, the kind of collection is done by <coughs> the procedure is called lumbar puncture. In order to do the lumbar puncture, a spinal needle is needed. Spinal needle is inserted between the lumbar vertebrae at the level of L3 or L4 or L4 or L5. So, and CSF will be aspirated or CSF will be taken. So, lumbar puncture is a diagnostic procedure usually, but even for therapy, there is a, another lump type of lumbar puncture called therapeutic puncture, lumbar puncture. Is, this is in order to relieve intracranial pressure because maybe because of high volume of the or any uh, increased pressure in the inside the brain or spinal cord. We can remove little bit of uh, that, uh, that CSF which relieve the pressure. So, lumbar puncture it is a diagnostic and therapeutic procedure done by a spinal needle and at the level of L3, L4 or L4, L5. Now, we were discussing about the uh, anatomy of the spinal cord. We will go through the cross section of the spinal cord. Once you see the cross section of the spinal cord, there will be a tiny canal, central canal in the spinal cord. A tiny central canal is present at the center of the spinal cord and this tiny central canal contain cerebrospinal fluid. Now, there are gray matter and white matter is present at the spinal cord. The gray matter is inside and white matter is outside the spinal cord. So, there is a inside gray matter and outside, gray mat outside white matter is there in the spinal cord. Now, gray matter forms H shaped structure that is inside you can see in the you can see in the picture there is a H shaped structure can be seen it is made up of gray matter. Now, the white matter is seen outside. Now, the spinal cord is divided into more or less symmetrical halves by a deep groove called anterior median fissure. You can see an anterior median fissure or ventral median fissure on the anterior side and a median septum called a posterior median sulcus or septum on the posterior side. So, we can divide the spinal cord into two parts by through this septum and this uh, fissure. There is an anterior median fissure and a posterior median sulcus or posterior median fissure is can be see, uh, septum can be seen in the spinal cord. Now, from both sides of the spinal cord from the gray matter we can see Extending from the spinal cord, there are ventral and dorsal roots of the spinal nerve emerge from the gray matter of the spinal cord. Now, the gray matter, gray matter this contain especially the neuron cells, body, cell bodies, dendrites and axon is the main part of this gray matter. So, because of this pinkish gray color, because of that it is called as gray matter it is due to the presence of rich network of blood. Now, the gray matter can be divided into three parts, posterior horns, anterior horns and lateral horns. So, there are posterior, two posterior horns are there. You can see two anterior horns are there and two lateral horns on lateral sides. So, this is, this forms, this will get H shaped gray matter. So, the gray matter can be divided into anterior horns, posterior horns and 
lateral horns. So that's all, that's about gray matter. Now outside the gray matter we have white matter. It is mainly composed of myelinated nerve fibers. That's why the color become white. The white matter can be divided into three pair of column or faniculae of myelinated fibers. There is an anterior, uh, posterior lateral. Anterior is the there is an anterior faniculae. There is a posterior faniculae, there is a uh, lateral faniculae, then there is a commissure area also. Now, the bundle of the fibers with each faniculae are divided into tracts. So, the, the white matter contains lots of tracts. So, there are lots of bundle of nerve fibers are there at each faniculae and this bundle of fibers are called the tracts or fasciculae. Now, there are there are lots of fibers, nerve fibers are there. This is known as tracts. There are two types of tracts commonly seen at the white matter. These are the ascending tracts and the descending tracts. Ascending tracts are the tracts which received information the from the spinal cord is transferred into the brain. And descending tracts are the tracts which receives information from the brain and it is transferred through the spinal cord to the so, when the brain directs the motor activities, these directions are in the form of nerve impulses and travel down the spinal cord through the descending tract fibers. So, ascending tracts are the sensory tracts and descending tracts are the motor tracts. Now, the regarding the ascending tracts, the it carry signals it carry ascending tracts are the as tracts which carry signals in the spinal cord. Typically, three types of neurons are available in the ascending tracts. In the tracts. The first order, there are first order neuron, there are second order neuron, there are third order neuron. First order neuron, it detects the stimulus and carries into the spinal cord. So, first there are first order neuron. It carries, it detects the stimulus and carries into the spinal cord. Second order neuron is seen within the spinal cord. It is continuous to the thalamus, to the sensory, that is, thalamus is the sensory relay station. So, second order neuron in the spinal cord carries to the thalamus. Then, third order neuron, it carries signals from thalamus to the sensory region of the cerebral cortex. So, once you say the ascending tracks, the prefix will be spino. For example, the spinothalamic tract, uh, spino reticular tracts, spino cerebellar tracts. The tracts which prefix spino means these are the ascending tracts. So, it is having three neurons, a first order neuron that is uh, detect the impulse and carries impulse a stimulus and carries to the spinal cord, second order neuron. It, can, it is in the spinal cord and it, and it reaches till the thalamus and a third order neuron which carries signal from thalamus to the, to the sensory region of the cerebral cortex. Now, which are the ascending tracts? These are dorsal column tract, dorsal column tract, spinothalamic tract, Spino-reticular tract and spino-cerebellar tracts are the ascending tracts. So, dorsal colon tract, dorsal spinothalamic tract, spino-reticular tract and uh, spino-cerebellar tracts are the descending tracts, ascending tracts. Then descending tracts are the motor tracts. These are pyramidal tracts, these can be divided into pyramidal tracts and extra pyramidal tract. Pyramidal tract include lateral corticospinal and anterior corticospinal tract. Then extra pyramidal tract includes rubrospinal tract, reticulospinal tract, olivospinal tract and vestibulospinal tract. So, we were discussing about the ascending tracts. The first ascending tract is the dorsal column tract. Dorsal column tract is a tract which 
which carry sensations related to the discriminative, discriminative touch, visceral pain, vibration and proprioception. Discriminative touch, visceral pain, vibration and proprioception is carried through dorsal column tract to the brain. Now, it is having again three neurons, the first order neuron. First order neuron, it detects the stimulus. There is fasciculus gracilis and fasciculus cuneatus is there. Fasciculus gracilis carries sensation from below T6 and fasciculus cuneatus carries sensation from T6 or higher level. And there is second order neuron. Its synapses is the first order neuron in the medulla and its deposits. Then the third order it travels up and the third order neuron synapses with the second order neuron at the thalamus and carries signal to the cerebral cortex that is at the post central gyrus. The system it is a contralateral system. So, the, this is the dorsal colon tract. It is a tract which uh, carries sensation of discriminative touch, visceral pain, proprioception and vibration. Next type of ascending tract is the spinothalamic tract or spinothalamic pathway. Now, spinothalamic pathway is the pathway or tract which carries sensation of pain, pressure, temperature, light touch, tickle and itch. It is located in the anterior and lateral columns. Then deposition of the second order neuron occurs in the spinal cord and third order neuron arise again at the thalamus level and continue to the cerebral cortex of the post central gyrus. So, second the ascending tract is the spinothalamic tract. Next there is we have the spinoreticular tract especially it carries the pain signal from, uh, from a tissue injury site. So, the deposit in the spinal cord and ascend uh, uh, with the spinothalamic fibers and end with reticular formation. Third and fourth new order neurons are the, it continue to the thalamus and cerebral cortex. So, there are spinal, four, third and fourth order neurons are present in the spinoreticular tract. Next ascending tract is the spinocerebellar tract. In the spinocerebellar tract, the first order neuron originate in the muscles and tendon. In the second order neuron ascend in the ipsilateral, ipsilateral lateral column and it terminate in the cerebellum <coughs> and it transmit proprioceptive signals from the limbs and the tract. So, spinocerebellar tracts to tra for the transmission of proprioceptive signals from the limbs and tract. So, these were the ascending tracts or the sensory tracts like ascending uh, uh, like ascending pathways there are uh, descending or motor pathways are also there in the spinal cord. So, the descending tracts deliver efferent impulse from the brain to the spinal cord. So, descending pathways can be divided into two groups a direct pathway that is called pyramidal tract and indirect pathway it is called extra pyramidal tract. Now, this motor pathway or descending tracts include two types of neuron. There is upper motor neuron and the lower motor neuron. Upper motor neuron begins with the, begins with the soma in the cerebral cortex or brainstem and lower motor neuron uh, that is in the soma in the anterior horn axon leads to the muscle. Now, we, we can divide the, uh, we can divide it the tracts into two types. The descending tracts into two types that is pyramidal tracts or pyramidal system. It is also called a corticospinal tracts and an extra pyramidal system. Now, we will discuss about the pyramidal system or corticospinal tract. These are the direct system, direct pathways which originate from the pyramidal neurons in the percentile gyri in the, in the brain. Now, pyramidal neuron is in upper motor neuron is in the upper motor neuron and it forms the corticospinal tracts. The upper motor neuron synapses in the anterior horn with the lower motor neuron. Then this lower motor neuron activate the skeletal muscles. The direct pathway, this direct pathway regulate fast and fine skill movements that is 
this fast movement and skilled movement is directed by the the, the direct the pyramidal tract. Now, lat there are two types of pyramidal tracts are there, there are two parts are there, there is a lateral corticospinal tract and anterior corticospinal tract. In lateral corticospinal tract, upper motor nerve, upper motor neuron deposits in the pyramids of the medulla and in the anterior corticospinal tract, upper motor neuron deposits at the spinal cord at the spinal cord level. You can see the uh, pyramidal tract system in the picture. Now, there are some tr some other descending system other than the pyramidal system. This is these are called extra pyramidal system. Now, its upper motor neuron originates in nuclei deep in the cerebrum, and upper motor neuron does not pass through the pyramids. And lower motor neuron is in the anterior horn of the motor neuron. It is at the uh, lower motor neuron is an anterior horn motor neuron and this system includes the indirect system or extra pyramidal system includes rubrospinal tract, vestibulospinal tract, reticulospinal tract and tectospinal tract. So, <clears throat> these are not like pyramidal system, this in the extra pyramidal system is multisynaptic. Now, the different extra pyramidal system we already uh, named it tectospinal tract, reticulospinal tract, vestibulospinal tracts and rubrospinal tract. Tectospinal tract the reflux it is the, it produces the reflux turning of the head in response to the sight and sound. Reticulospinal tract this function is it control the limb movement important to maintain the post it is so it is important to maintain the posture and balance. So, reticular uh, spinal tract controls the limb movements. So, it is important to maintain the posture and balance. Next is the vestibular spinal tract that is uh, especially its main function is postural muscle activity uh, that is controlled. And rubro spinal tract it originates from the red nucleus of the midbrain and it controls the flexor muscles. So, you can see the picture of each tracts in the in this we can see picture of all the different descending tracks here. Now, we will be discussing about the spinal nerves. So, we already discussed is that spinal nerve is a part of the peripheral nervous system. There are 31 pairs of the spinal nerve that is 8 at the cervical level, 12 at the thoracic level, 5 at lumbar level. 5 at sacral level and 1 at coccygeal level. Now, how the spinal nerves are formed? It is for each spinal nerve is formed by the union of the anterior and posterior roots in the intervertebral foramen. Now, the anterior root it contains the motor fibers for the skeletal muscle. Those from the those from the T1 to T. So, anterior root it contains the motor fibers for the skeletal muscle. Those from T1 to L2 contain sympathetic fibers, S2 and S4 contain parasympathetic fibers. Posterior root contain the sensory fibers whose cell bodies are in the spinal ganglion. So, it is formed from the posterior and anterior root, the spinal nerves are formed from anterior and posterior root. Now, once we see the functional component, we can see there are four functional components are there for the spinal nerves. There is a somatic efferent nerve fiber is there, there is a visceral efferent nerve fiber is there, somatic efferent nerve fiber, afferent nerve fiber is there and visceral afferent nerve fiber is there. Somatic efferent nerve fiber is the fibers that transmit motor impulse from spinal cord to the skeletal muscle. Visceral efferent nerve fiber is fiber that transport that trans or transmit the motor impulse from spinal cord to the smooth muscle, cardiac muscle or glands. These are the visceral efferent nerve fiber. So, afferent is just opposite of that. That is somatic afferent nerve fiber means the fibers that transmit uh, uh, fr that transmit extraceptive and proprioceptive impulse that is sensory impulse from body to the spinal cord. Visceral means the fibers that transmit impulses from viscera to the spinal cord. So, functionally it is having four components, if the functionally a spinal nerve is having four components, 
these are the somatic efferent visceral efferent somatic afferent visceral afferent now what is a nerve plexus we might have heard lots of regarding the nerve plexus like brachial plexus like lumbar plexus like cervical plexus what is the what is meant by nerve plexus it's a complex interwoven network of the nerve it's called nerve plexus three large plexus are seen at the body these are cervical plexus brachial plexus and lumbosacral plexus the lumbosacral plexus can be further divided into lumbar plexus sacral plexus so nerve plexus means plex uh, this is a complex or there is a complex interwoven nerves so mainly three types of plexus are seen in the body cervical plexus brachial plexus and lumbosacral plexus now we might have heard upper neuro upper motor neuro and lower motor neuro what is upper motor neuro or lower motor neuro upper motor neuro means the motor neurons that originate from the motor region of the cerebral cortex or brain stem and carry the motor information down to the final common pathway that is any motor neuron that are not directly responsible for region Uh, 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 stimulating the targeting muscle is known as upper motor neuron and the 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 motor neuron which directly responsible for stimulating the target muscle is known as lower motor neuron so that is the difference between upper and lower motor neuron lower motor neuron means the motor neuron connecting the brain stem and spinal cord to the muscle fiber bringing the nerve impulses from upper motor neuron to the muscle or from the to the muscle to the uh, central nervous system a motor neuron a lower motor neuron axon terminates at the muscle so a motor neuron's axon terminates at the muscle it's called lower motor neuron and uh, uh, which is not in contact with the effector muscle it's called upper motor neuron now what is a motor unit motor unit can be defined as a single motor neuron and the group of muscle that muscle fibers it is innervated so all muscle fiber is in a single motor unit consist of the same muscle fiber type now a muscle fi a single motor neuron and the muscle fibers supplied by the Uh, by this motor neuron is considered as a motor unit now we discussed about the spinal cord it's having lots of functions so there are lots of tracks passing through the spinal cord so it's having both motor and sensory tracks are passing through what will happen once the spinal cord may get injured usually the spinal cord may get damaged usually during a, any trauma or any diseases or road even during road traffic accidents so spinal cord injury is damaged the uh, causes damage to the spinal cord and which result in loss of function of the spinal cord so both motor and chance so there is may be chance of motor and sensory function may get affected so the frequent causes are the trauma and diseases so that spinal cord may get damaged it causes loss of function uh, loss of function completely and partially that is both sensory and motor function may get affected because both motor and sensory pathway passes through the spinal cord now what are the different types of spinal cord paralysis depending upon the location and extent of injury the different forms of paralysis can occur that is once there is motor, uh, once there is a spinal cord injury sometimes it may cause paralysis so what where is the uh, how much type how much injury is there how much what is the location of the injury then the paralysis may differ monoplegia means paralysis of one limb diplegia means paralysis of both upper or both or lower limbs paraplegia means paralysis of both lower limb hemiplegia means paralysis of upper limb torso and lower limb of the one side of the body so if the paralysis on one side of the body it's called hemiplegia quadriplegia means paralysis of all four limbs now what will happen 
what each will go through, what will happen if there is spinal cord injury at each level. If the injury is at the cervical level, at C1, between C1 and C3, all daily functions, all daily activities must be totally assisted. Breathing will be dependent on ventilator. Motorized wheelchair controlled by sip and puff or chin movement is required at this stage. Now, if the injury, if the spinal cord injury at is at C4 level, the all the things, all the uh, all the conditions will be almost same as that of C1 and C3, but breathing gets spared. That is, breathing can be done without a ventilator. Now, if the paralysis is at such C5 level, there will be proper good heck, uh, head and neck shoulder movements as well as elbow flexion, but still electrical wheelchair is required for and short distance with the support of some person he can move, movement can be done. Now, if it is at C6 level, wrist flexion, wrist extension movement will be good, uh, but assistance needed for dressing, transition of the bed to the chair or car may be needed assistance. If C7 and C8 level is at the C7 and C8, all the hand movement will get spared, all the hand movement will get, uh, all, uh, will get the all hand movements and ability to dress, eat, drive, do transfer and do upper body washes. Now, if the paralysis at, at the thoracic level, that is even if at T1 and to T4, normal communication skills may be there, help only may be only be needed for heavy, heavy uh, that is loading wheelchair into a car, etc. If it is T5 to T9, manual wheelchair can be done for everyday uh, daily living and independent for personal care. And if it is a T10 to L1, partial paralysis of the lower body will be there. If it is between L2 and S5, some knee, hip and foot movements with possible slow, difficult walking with the assistance or aids. Only heavy home maintenance and hard cleaning will need assistance. Now, now the spinal cord injury, these are these we were discussing about the uh, complete injuries, complete cut. Spinal cord injury may be complete or incomplete. So, spinal cord syndrome can be classified either a complete or incomplete categories. Complete is characterized by complete loss of motor and sensory function below the level of traumatic lesion. Incomplete is characterized by different neurological findings that is partial loss of sensor, partial loss of motor function below the lesion. So, injury may be the spinal cord injury may be partial or uh, complete. So, complete means all the motor function and sensory function will be below the level get affected, but incomplete some uh, functions will, get, is, will be spared and this, there will be partial loss of sensory or motor functions. Now, central so will partial lesion, will go through some partial lesion. So, so, first one is a central cord lesion usually involves in the cervical region. It usually results from the cervical hyperextension causing an ischemic injury to the central part of the cord. So, central part of the cord get affected. So, there will be motor weakness is present in the upper limb than lower limb. So, this, as the central cord is get affected, in the central cord syndrome, there will be motor weakness will be more in the upper limb than the lower limb. Then, then patient more likely to lose the pain and temperature sensation than the proprioception. Patient may complain of burning feeling in the upper lungs and more commonly seen in older patients with cervical arthritis and narrowing of the spinal cord. So, central cord syndrome means the center part will get affected. So, usually there will be 
upper limb will be affected than lower limb and uh, patients may complain of burning feeling in the upper limb and they may lose pain and temperature but since uh, but uh, proprioception may get spared. Next type of lesion is the brown sequard lesion. In brown sequard lesion one side of the spinal cord one side one half of the spinal cord may get affected. That is it is brown sequard syndrome may result from an injury only to, to only half of the spinal cord and is most noticed in cervical region again. Is of, uh, usually a tumor or a trauma or inflammation may cause brown sequard syndrome. So, there will be motor loss is evident on the same side as the injury to the spinal cord. Sensory loss is evident on the opposite side especially on the opposite side of the location. Then bowel and bladder will be normal. Person is normally able to walk through some bracing or, stab or a stability device may be required. The next one is the anterior spinal cord syndrome. It is usually uh, result from a compression of the artery that runs along in front of the spinal cord. So, compression of the spinal cord may form, uh, uh, may be, may be from a uh, bone fragment or a large his, uh, herniation. Even a bone fragment or a uh, disc herniation may cause compression of the anterior spinal cord syndrome. Patient with anterior spinal cord syndrome have a variable amount of motor function below the level of injury. Depends upon which area, which track is get, which side of the anterior side is get affected. Sensation to the pain and temperature also lo are lost while the sensitivity to the vibration and proprioception are preserved. So, these are the different types of the spinal cord uh, paralysis that is spinal cord injury. It may be a partial injury or a complete injury that is partial injury uh, that is partial injury is again central cord syndrome is the brown cord syndrome and anterior spinal cord syndrome. Now, this session we discussed about the anatomy and anatomy of the spinal cord and it is regarding the covering the meninges and it is part of the meninges. We discussed about the spaces and we discussed about the cerebrospinal fluid how it is formed and how it is circulated and we discussed then we discussed about how the uh, about the anatomy of the spinal cord and regarding the gram matter. Then we discussed about the tracts of the spinal cord including the ascending tracts are there and descending tracts are there. Ascending tracts are the sensory tracts and descending tracts are the motor tracts. Hence, there are spinal nerves are there and nerve plexus are there.